um, there's a couple of people that are recognized as the father of rocketry. They basically created the calculations to get us into space, to get us out into space. And one of these people is Jack Parsons, probably the most uh, effective. Uh, Werner von Braun is one as well. Um, but he actually gave a lot of credit to Parsons and said, Parsons figured all of this out. And how did Parsons figure this out? Well, he had a really interesting way. He lived in the early 20th century, and he was working on rocket technology. But he also was a friend of L. Ron Hubbard, who started Scientology, and Aleister Crowley. And he had this crazy life. And he lived in Los Angeles, and he would do rituals in the desert. And he thought that these kinds of things would help him basically download this rocket technology and it's weird but as weird is Konstantin Tchaikovsky on the Russian side he didn't have the same belief system as Parsons but believed that he was in contact with angelic presences who would also allow him to you know create this rocket technology so that's what I'm talking about is like the people who are the most valuable to this program are the people that are doing the stuff that most people would have discounted because it's so weird and what it, what is it about these people that they are able to do these quote-unquote downloads that they talk about that you talk about in your book like Tyler has this specific protocol that allows him to connect with with nature and this network of nature Yes. So um, a lot of the people, basically, they're fall, even if they don't know they are, um, in my field, uh, we also study monastic traditions. Like, you know, there's a history of monastic traditions, people who are monks and nuns, and they tend to uh, live in communities with each other and work on their spiritual growth, basically. Um, do things like pray a lot, you know, study a lot. And so what I noticed about Tyler was that he lived a fairly monastic life, even though he would never know that or call it that. But um, he had these, these what I called protocols. Um, they were physical and spiritual and mental protocols. And what I noticed was that a lot of people who were doing the same kind of work followed these protocols. And they enabled them to download information that they were interested in. Um, they could be useful things like technologies um, or, you know, other things like artistic things, projects and things like that. And so when I finished American Cosmic and it, it was out there, a lot of people with this ability reached out to me. And I met a lot of very incredibly successful people um, who were doing this their whole lives, doing this similar thing their whole lives. And so I interviewed them too, because <laughs> I wanted to know, you know, what, what's going on? What were they doing? Why are they doing this? And so what I figured out for the most part is that religions, different traditional religions were the traditions that held these technologies. And now I see these protocols as like body technologies or, you know, technologies of connection. And they would um, enable people to be super creative and help culture in many ways. Like Teresa of Avila is a doctor of the church. She was able to do this. She was a, a nun. Um, and a lot of the tradition in the Catholic tradition, the saints, they were doing the same thing. They were, you know, they had these practices that enabled them, they believed, to connect to their God. But that's just because we didn't have a global society. Now we have a global society and we can actually do analysis of what's going on when people are connecting. Harvard's done studies of people who meditate and how it changes, phys physiologically changes your brain structure, right? Wow. Yeah. So, you know, so I think that this is, if I were to say the one thing I learned most from my work so far into UFOs is I learned about these protocols and I met a lot of people who do them. And that's what I'm interested in right now is that because it seems to me that the other stuff is a huge distraction because if we could just focus on this type of thing, it would, you know, where people, <laughs> you know, they're able to resist being distracted by media and, you know, focus on on what they what they actually are interested in. You know, what are you really interested mm -hmm. in instead of being um 
hung up on, you know, being distracted by stuff and consuming stuff and going on to the next thing because you're bored. The idea is that our bodies are the we're at the cellular level, it's all electronic, right? Like the the mm -hmm. electrons in our bodies that that make up our our atoms and our cells and our DNA and everything about us that we're like 90% water and the idea behind this is that uh, I'm sorry if I'm messing this up, but that our bodies are like these radio transmitters mm -hmm. and that like if we can treat our body the right way and eliminate all of these outside peripheral signals that we can connect to some sort of some sort of network. Yes. Uh, so I've talked to a lot of people about this because, you know, at some point my own training fails me and I need to like mm -hmm. access people who are really into AI or into, you know, that are scientists. Mm -hmm. And so I've talked to a lot of them and there are two different kinds of theories. One is that it's like a network, right? Um, and there was a Jesuit priest in the early 20th century who felt this network. His name is uh, Chardon, uh, Tellier Chardon. Right. And um, so he described it as the newest fear. And so he felt this network when he was on the front in World War I. And, um, you know, there's a lot of tension going on there. And he felt like this was going to connect with technology in the future. And he felt like, you know, his work is interpreted in different ways. But I interpret his work as basically saying that there's almost like a new form of a human that's going to happen in the early 21st century. And... And he sees it as connected to this network. Um, a new form of human. Yeah. And a lot, so I met a lot of people who believe this too. So he's a very well-known philosopher in communities of people who are creating AI. And so the belief systems of people who are creating AI, I interviewed them too, because, you know, you get, because really I was interviewing people who were in Silicon Valley, believing in aliens and ET and reverse engineering things. Um, you know, in uh, for American Cosmic. Well, the whole world has shifted. AI is something that wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal in that time period, but it's now become super public. And so um, during the time period that American Cosmic was published and, and then this book here that I just finished, um, I focused on people who were in these communities of AI. And um, a lot of them know about this idea of the organic network that's now somewhat infiltrated with the actual other internet and mm. how these you know how your body's impacted by it's competing each. with the internet right kind of i mean um let's put it this way some of them said that they do detox from the internet yes. in order to connect to the the original i guess you know network in order to come back and code <laughs> which is so ironic wow. but yeah Going back to Gary Nolan's work, brain structure, and he, he talks about specific brain structure and a specific part of the brain that is developed and I think it's like what, it's like 1% of the population? I don't know what percentage it is, but he was studying, um, I don't know if Gary's talking about it with respect to spiritual spirituality or religion, mm. but he's definitely talking about it with respect to um, people who access this data that allows them to do downloading. That's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So these are like high-functioning people who are downloading um, information that's really helpful, generally technologies. And it's the Kade Pudaman, that the part of the brain that he was looking at. What is it called again? The, it's called the Kade. Um, the Kade. I think it's the Kade Pudaman. The I think Kade that's it. Pudaman. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm these protocols that Tyler specifically talks about is not something that should be practiced by everyday people to try to access this, or is this something that, that all people can try to do? Oh, I think that, I mean, honestly, it's, I think all people should, should do the things that he was doing. I mean, maybe not to that extent because they're pretty intense, but I mean, he's just talking about having, okay, let's put it this way. In many traditions, your body is, religious traditions, your body is considered a temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what is it a temple of? It's going to be a temple of God, <laughs> right? So it's a temple that, so this idea has been around for a while. We just forgot about it. And so it's being, 
you know, I'm looking at it and saying, hey, you know, this has been around for a while and these people are doing it to great effect. And it's basically making sure that you're you're healthy and you keep your body, you know, um, if it is the case that we're transmitting and receiving information, that you're keeping it, your body clear enough and healthy enough to do that. So mm. I think it's kind of like a human thing. I think a lot of people can do it. Um, is it simple stuff like getting good sleep, drinking a lot of water? It's totally simple taking stuff. Taking your vitamins. Yeah, it's simple stuff. But when you look at the science behind it, you're like, oh, so that's the reason why. So getting enough water, um, our bodies, so, so Moon Girl explained this to me. She said our bodies are like 90, no, not, I'm sorry, like 80% water, 78, 80% water. And the water is like the universal conductor. It's conducting electricity. And a lot of things that are happening in our bodies are electrical. So we're just, you know, making sure that the water is clear in mm. order for these things to, you know, to, for, in order for us to um, be at our peak. <laughs> 